There's a story. Fuck him, Richard. He was born. What you got? Hey man, I just saw a 65 year old gentleman, previously healthy. He's a retired farmer, likes to hunt deer, into country music. He's weekend star at the bar apparently. There's no smoking or drinking history. Comes to the clinic today because he has been burning up a fever of uh, 103 degrees. Some muscle aches, feeling a little short of breath, a little bit of a cough. Respirations are 23 and oxygen saturation of 94%. COVID negative? If he was COVID positive, would I be calling you? Touche. Any other symptoms? Yeah, he has been quite diaphoretic and lethargic. I uh, had some confusion too. In fact, his wife saw him go unresponsive on the car right here and she kept slapping him. Ah, And uh, when did he get sick? Five days ago. Did he do anything unusual? I mean, nothing out of the ordinary. He answers no to all of these questions. And what did his x-ray show? Yeah, no lung infiltrates, no pleural effusion, and guess what? His white count is actually normal, and so are the rest of his labs. So he's acutely unwell, he's febrile, diaphoretic, dysnic, some cough, but not bringing up any phlegm. This might be the onset of pneumonia, even with a normal white count and chest x-ray. It's possible that this hasn't blossomed on the chest x-ray yet. It's also possible that this is starting out as a bronchitis, which could progress to pneumonia. Regardless, this screams infection. He's going to need to get blood cultures, procalcitonin level, and start him on azithromycin and cefuroxime to cover for community-acquired pneumonia. Hmm, agreed. I mean, he looks well enough for now, and he's hell-bent on getting to the wedding. So I'll send him home and check on him in a couple of days. Yeah, and with his respiratory status, we're going to have to keep a close eye on him. And five days later, he's feeling like shit. And when you listen to his lungs, he has decreased breath sounds at the right base and he feels more short of breath. His primary care doctor sends him to the ER, which he only agreed to do because his wife said, no woohoo for you. Mm. Mm. Eventually in the ER, he gets a chest x-ray, which shows fluid building up around his right lung. And I would classify this as a moderate sized pleural effusion. After that, he gets a CT scan of his chest, which is basically a higher quality picture version of an x-ray. The CT scan again shows the pleural effusion, and it also shows mediastinal lymph adenopathy, meaning in the mediastinum of the chest, there's lymph nodes there that are enlarged. Even though the supplemental oxygen they gave him makes him feel a little better for the time being, the ER doctor, of course, still wants to admit him to the hospital and do a thoracentesis meaning stick a needle in his back to drain that fluid. One, because that'll make him feel better, and two, because that might give us a diagnosis. But he wants none of it. He rips out the IV, and he leaves AMA. And on his way out, he yells, You guys are slower than fucking molasses. I'm not gonna miss her wedding. Amazingly, he makes it to the wedding, and it's his big moment. He says, I wrote this song for the groomsmen today, who will be part of our family on this very special day and onward. Born to Richard, he was born to. He drops to the floor. Everyone can't believe what they just saw and someone calls 911. Now he's in the ICU requiring 100% oxygen and he's getting some powerful antibiotics, Zosin and Vancomycin. And so we do a thoracentesis and we drain one liter of fluid. Now tests on the pleural fluid usually provide some clues, but usually doesn't give a conclusive answer. The first thing we want to know with these tests, is this a transudate or an exudate? A transudate means that the fluid is more like water, while an exudate is more like a protein shake. Or maybe a beer is more of your thing. He looked like number three. And if it meets any of these criteria, we call it an exudate. The tests show that he has an exudate. But looking at the other lab parameters, that can help narrow down the differential diagnosis. We look at things like total red blood cell count, white blood cell count, even the numbers of the different types of white blood cells, like number of neutrophils and lymphocytes, the amount of glucose in there, triglycerides, cholesterol, and even pH. We look to see if there's any bacteria in there, cancer cells, and a whole lot more. Exudative effusions in someone who has a fever is usually infectious. Now, when it's bacterial pneumonia, or lupus or acute pancreatitis, these exudative effusions 
typically have white blood cell counts more than 10,000. Chronic exudates, for example, with tuberculosis and with cancer, they typically have white blood cell counts less than 5,000. His was about 3,300. Pleural fluid lymphocytosis, particularly with lymphocyte counts representing 85 to 95% of the total white blood cells, that typically occurs with tuberculosis, lymphoma, sarcoidosis, and rheumatoid arthritis. It's tuberculosis. Think about it. Fevers, cough, shortness of breath, and a lymphocytic pleural effusion. What else could it be? If you're hearing hoofbeats... Think horses, not zebras, I know. But in this case, all I see is stripes. I mean, we're still waiting on the AFB smear and the PCR to come back, but I'd be shocked if they don't come back positive. Well, he lives in the Midwest, never traveled to a tuberculosis hotspot, and he hasn't been in contact with anyone who's had it. I don't know how he got it, but how else would you explain his lymphocytic pleural effusion? Technically, yeah, it was lymphocytic predominant, but only 69%. Typically with tuberculosis pleural effusions, the lymphocytes are around 90%. Also, the glucose level was normal, which if this were tuberculosis, that would be low. So what do you want to do? Unless the TB tests come back positive, we're assuming this is a different infection. It's possible he has some resistant bacteria brewing in there. Yeah, man. That or we don't have the right infection. I would broaden his antibiotics. Yeah, we just started Mero and Dapto. It's not looking good, man. The daughter shows up to the ICU in her wedding gown, bawling her eyes out. So I'm handing her Kleenex and she tells me she saw her dad two weeks ago at dinner where he had cooked some deer heart for her. And she turned that down, which obviously broke his heart. But then she said he had hunted a deer a year ago, um, saw that the liver was black and the meat looked rotten. So he threw it away, but kept the heart because it looked good. This case forced me to comb through my medical books for hours on end. To figure out this mystery, I like to look at it from different angles and see how the pieces of the puzzle fit together. Like... What is the differential diagnosis of fever, cough, and chest pain? What is the differential diagnosis of fever with lymph node involvement? The differential of fever in zoonoses, fever in mycoses, fever with pleural effusion, and what infections could cause this that would not be killed with zosin and vancomycin? And when you narrow it down, there's three diagnoses that keep popping up on my radar. One, anthrax. Two, bubonic plague and three, tularemia, which, come to think about it, they're all biological weapons. Mind blown. Dude, what happened? I thought you were in love with horses. I am, but I also love unicorns. Do you actually think he has anthrax? Fair enough. Bubonic plague? Did he kiss a rat and travel from the 14th century? Well, there are five cases in the Midwest every year. It's unlikely, but still can't rule it out at this point. Did the blood cultures come back yet? Yeah, still negative. Oh, it's tularemia, man. Think about it. He hunts the deer, he flays it open, he sees that the liver is black, and the only thing he takes is the heart because it doesn't look like it's ruined. But usually, tularemia is in rodents and rabbits, not deer. And even if the deer had tularemia, the meat was frozen for an entire year. I hear you, but this bacteria, Francisella tularensis, it can survive in a dead animal for a long time and it can survive freezing temperatures for several years. In the United States, there are over 100 different species that it can infect, including deer. Oh dear, he needs the stat gentamicin and the serologies, eh? Yes, let's check IgG and IgM antibodies. That's all for this one. If you like these types of videos, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button and hit that bell notification, that way you can get notified of when my next one comes out. And maybe you have an interesting medical case that you want me to do a video on, or maybe you just have a medical case that you wanna share in the comments below. Also, you can check me out on Instagram for other updates. So, see you soon.